Hello and welcome to our NQT Top Tips video. My name is Cheryl Abbas and I'm an NQT lead and a specialist lead of education for the Children Learning Trust. Today myself and my colleagues are going to talk through with you some tips we can give you for your NQT year. Now we know lots of these things you have done during your training but just a reminder of those things when those days when you're thinking things are getting a little bit tougher. Just remind us of some help and a way to move your career forward. Hi, Shanila Abbas here, Assistant Head Teacher at Chiltern Academy, and I'm a professional tutor. I've been mentoring for years, PGC students and NQTs, and so I've seen, I've seen, I've, I've got a lot of experience in this field. Uh, I've been asked to give you some advice, so I've thought of five pieces of advice that I would like to have heard when I was an NQT, so I'm going to share them with you. My advice number one would be don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, ask your professional tutor, ask your mentor, nothing's, you know, any questions, please don't be afraid to ask, you know, if you're, you don't understand what's been said or you don't understand the school systems, just ask someone. Um, in my school, I've, uh, I've actually attached a buddy to each NQT, so they don't have to always go to their mentors or their professional tutors, they've got a buddy. But you can also, if you haven't been assigned a buddy, maybe you can ask someone to be your buddy in your department to just help you through the process and that will be really beneficial to you. But please don't be afraid to ask any questions. Advice number number two is don't be too hard on yourselves. We're very self-critical. We, we, you know, we feel like as an NQT, you're probably thinking I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna develop, you know, deliver the best lessons. That's not the case. It's not always gonna happen. You're gonna learn, you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna have times where you're gonna have really good lessons. Sometimes you're gonna have really bad lessons. It happens even now to me, it happens. So. Please don't be too hard on yourselves, you know, take it in your stride and learn from the experience, but please don't let it knock your confidence. Advice number three, don't be overwhelmed by the workload. You will be doing a lot of work. You're going to be planning lessons uh, compared to your ITT, you know, where you will may, t may be teaching one or two lessons, you'll have four or five lessons in a day. So please don't be overwhelmed. If you do feel overwhelmed, do speak to someone, speak to your mentor on how you can cope with the workload, what you can do, get some advice from people, how they cope. But yeah, don't get too overwhelmed and don't keep it to yourselves. Do talk to someone about it. Advice number Build a relationship with your mentor. I think that's so, so important. If you have a, an honest and transparent relationship with your mentor and you can be very honest and direct and you can talk about everything, that's going to really help you develop as a teacher and it will also help the mentor know where you're at in your teaching career and what they need to do to develop and to support you through the process. So please try to build a relationship with your mentor. If you feel like you cannot, be built, you, you can't build a uh, relationship with your mentor, speak to your professional tutor about it and then we they can maybe help either change or to speak to the mentor about the, the relationship that you have with them. But your mentor is your key person in your NQT year that's going to help you become the teacher you are. So make sure you use that and utilise that that's experience that they have to help you develop. And as I said, transparency and honesty is the key. And my last piece of advice, advice would be to take control of your professional development. If you feel like that your behavior management needs a little bit of, um, you need some training on that, speak to your mentor about it, speak to your professional tutor and say, look, I'd like some training or I'd like to shadow someone who's good at behavior management. Maybe you need some help with your subject knowledge, you're struggling with a certain topic, then also speak to your head of department, speak to your mentor and ask them, look, I'm struggling with this topic and I don't know how to teach or, you know, I, I, how do I teach this? Go and speak to someone, but take control of your own professional development. Don't expect your mentor or your professional tutor to always come up with your what, what ideas or what you need for professional development. It's really important that it comes from yourself and it is a best spoke to your own needs. And I feel that will really help you develop your NQT year. Enjoy it. Enjoy teaching. Enjoy being in a classroom. Um, enjoy the whole experience. Um, you know, you're, you're there because you're a, te you're a good teacher. You are here now as an NQT because your, your ITT provider believes that you're a good teacher. And so take that, in, take that on board. Develop. As I said, we all make mistakes. We all have good lessons. We all have bad lessons. 
just take it in your stride, learn from your experiences and develop as a teacher and as an NQT. And I hope this was helpful and, and I'd like to say goodbye and good luck in your NQT year. I'm going to briefly talk through with you some assessment for learning strategies. So not only is assessment one of the really important teaching standards that you're going to be working to this year, but also it's something that we're using daily and minute by minute to assess how our classrooms are working. We know the importance of assessment for learning, how it can create success criteria for our students, how we include our feedback and marking to create evaluation, how we can use question and target setting. And in the classroom, it's the immediate feedback that you can gain and some longer term over the end of a lesson. But that, that piece of knowledge you can use to, to see where students are, what do they understand, what do they need to work on, and which parts of that, of that do they really understand. So there's lots of different ways that we can use assessment for learning in the classroom, and I'm sure you've used a variety of them through your training. But here's a couple of hints for you and some tips of things that you can do. So questioning, one that we all absolutely love to use. Try and avoid yes and no questions. Like, does this make sense? Because the chances are someone's going to say yes, whether it does or not. Think about how you can use open-ended questions that can get students writing or talking to each other or even bouncing questions from one to another. Can you ask an open-ended question that when one student answers, you can then build, a, build on that. You can tackle questions to pick it, take it around the room. Invite students to ask each other's questions to judge their knowledge and see where they're at. Questions are a really quick tool. You can use questioning to see instantly if a student understands a topic or an area that you're working with. Reflection, really important in all areas. Ask that give them time to reflect, whether that be a couple of moments to write down what they've learned, how they can apply it, whether that's a moment to have a think on their own and then share it with a partner. That could be something you ask them to run the board, they could share it with you. There's a variety of ways in which you can use reflection, but it's really important that we give them time. Don't ask students to reflect on something and then 30 seconds later expect them to have an answer. Give them a minute, give them two minutes, time to really think about what they have learned during that lesson. How can they apply that further? And then have that conversation with them. Use those question skills to see where they can go forward with it. Visual responses can be a really quick and easy way to very quickly assess how students have understood and what they've learned during a lesson. Use of whiteboards, writing down an answer to a question, uh, red, amber, green cards, um, signs with different answers, colour lolly sticks, whichever it may be, but something that the students can visually hold up at the same time so that you can see where students' knowledge and understanding is. It could be an answer to a question or it could be them judging their own knowledge of what they've learned in the lesson. This can be done at any point in the lesson. It gives you a time that you can stop, take track of where they are, and if you need to rework things, you can, or if you know that you can move forward, this gives you a clear process. It's also giving students that reflection time to have a think. You can use think, pair and share. So giving students a few moments on their own to think of a response to a question or a question they might like to ask others. Then pairing students up so they can discuss what they've learned or answering the questions for each other. Once that's done, they need to think about a question, another further question they could ask somebody else or a further response to that question that can be there shared with the whole class. It gives students, if you do it with facts, it gives them a chance to think about what's the most important thing they need to know and what piece of information they need for the next part of something. Socratic seminars, so students ask questions of one another about a topic or a selected text. It uh, initiates conversation between them. It initiates an opportunity for students to ask each other questions for things they might not be sure of. It gives them a chance to debate between each other and perhaps come out with a new understanding. So options, opportunities for students to talk to each other with a point, with a reference where they need to get to a certain end point, but having a chance to have that discussion. Three, two, one. You may have used this previously. So at the end of a lesson, you think about three things that they've learned from your lesson, two things they want to know more about, and one thing they may have a question about. This is really useful for students that potentially aren't confident about putting hands up, but have questions that they want to know more about. It also makes them think about what they have learned, whether it's a skill or a piece of knowledge, or what things have they learned during your lesson. And those two things they want to know something more about. You can then use this when you're marking their books to forward plan. You might have a group of students that all want to know something more about the same thing or a couple of students who all have questions in the same area you can then plan that into your lessons to help move students forward exit tickets a nice one questions up on the board or questions out on the desk you can give students the opportunity to select which question they'd like to answer they can write it in their books they can write it on a post-it note on a whiteboard or verbally as they leave the classroom but this gives you at the very last moment of your of your lesson an opportunity to assess students what they have taken in from that lesson it will give you time to think about quick about what they didn't perhaps take in that they could have or the things that worked really well. 
once you've gone through this, the best thing is to go back to your planner and just jot down any notes, particular themes that came up of same areas of confusion or particular questions that came up or if students were unsure of an area. And this gives you the best basis for your next lesson because it's time ready. You can see at the end of the lesson what they took in and where you need to move to next. A misconception check. So taking this the other way around, giving students facts or what they believe to be facts and asking them to consider whether they agree or disagree with them. Okay, these facts don't have to all be correct. You may put mistruths in there, misconceptions, particularly predictable misconceptions, things that students tend to think, even though you know they're not factual to the area that you're teaching. Giving them those facts make them really think, is this truthful? Do I need to look into this further? Do I need to research further? And they've got to think about not only do they disagree or agree, but they've got to be able to explain why they came to that decision. So why is assessment for learning important in the classroom? because it's how we understand what our students understand. We need to know what our students have learned in our lesson. We need to understand the elements they found harder and how we can move forward. It might be midway through a lesson that a student puts their hand up and asks a question, and that you realise that they've misunderstood a whole element of what you taught, and it's how you react to that. Or you may have some AFL built into your lesson and the students don't give the answers you're expecting. It's how you deal with that. Can you be flexible then to work over it? Don't push past it and ignore it didn't happen. Can you go back through some steps? Can you look at it from a different manner? But if we don't use those assessment for learning techniques in the classroom, we're not gonna understand where our students are. And although it is really useful to see what our students write in, the, write in their books, it's not time ready. That's after the lesson, that's the, that evening. Assessment for learning techniques gives you an opportunity to see during the lesson, in that time, in that moment, if the way you've planned your lesson, if that's working, if the students understand, and if they don't, it's just a chance for us to try and work through and find a different way forward for them. Okay, so it's really, really important that you're trying this in your lesson. And remember, if you try something and the students come back to you and say that they didn't understand something you've taught, it's not a failure, it's just an opportunity for you to think of a different way in which to teach it. Hello NQTs, I'm Mandy Ribico evans and I'm going to be talking to you for a few minutes, just giving you some top tips and ideas for marking when you start in September and to take away some of the worries and concerns about the impact of how much potential marking you'll have to do. Just some basic guidance. Okay. Titles, top tips for marking. Um, I don't want to read out the slide because I think it's self-explanatory, but I'm just going to add a few comments to each of the bullet points. I would suggest that marking definitely does vary depending on your subject. However, it should not be an onerous task and you shouldn't be up until midnight or one o'clock in the morning completing it. That is not a productive use of your time. Every school has its own marking policy. But from my experience, having worked in quite a few schools over my career, they're pretty similar. Within the schools, departments vary on the amount of uh, marking expectations they have or how much they expect you to do uh, over a period of time. It tends to be that people request marking deeply, which is, means more assessment marking, every two or three weeks. If you're marking for a formative assessment, obviously that is an addition. However, marking a student's piece of work deeply, so giving feedback, um, WWWs and EBIs, tends to be every two to three weeks. You're not expected to mark like that for every single piece of work a child completes in their books. There are a few points that I just want to refer to. Uh, some departments and schools use highlighters they are a great resource. So for example, where I've said here, use highlighters that connect to the department's marking criteria. Your department may have a particular grid that they put, or you will put in the front of every child's book, or they put in their books. And for example, if in autumn term two, there is a piece of an assessment piece where they're having to focus from an English perspective, because obviously I know more about that. But if they're focusing on uh, having to look at paragraphing, that the piece of work that you mark 
you or focus specifically on paragraphing. And each time the child uh, starts a new paragraph, indents or leaves a line, predominantly indenting, then you highlight it. This actually also helps the children in peer marking too. They know exactly what they're looking for. I've said not to be afraid to use stamps or stickers. Children love them because it's visual. So if you're going through a student's book and you, if you're going through a student's book and you are obviously not marking every piece, as I've said, you could actually just stamp the page to show that you've looked at it. And again, when a child looks through their books and sees well done, terrific, or even a smiley face, it just makes them feel really good. Peer marking, huge, wonderful resource. The children in front of you are your resource. And peer marking is a learning experience for the children as well, as long as it's set up in a very clear, standardized way. Lots of children, certainly the younger ones, will get their peers' work and just want to look through it and say, oh, that was good. That isn't productive and that doesn't help you for when you review that piece of work. So decide with the class what you are particularly looking for. Have they used particular terminology? So this across all subjects. If they've used particular terminology that you expect of them, the student marking their peers' work will look out for that and then can give them a positive www. If you have asked them to refer particular criteria as a whole class and they look at that criteria, see, even looking at the grid at the front of their book, they can then give a very constructive www. EBIs have to be thought about with children. They might say, just improve your handwriting. Well, that's pretty important, but if it's related to a particular piece of work you're focusing on and to a theme or a specific subject matter, you want them to focus on something that is constructive and not destructive. Live marking. I've said here that it can give you strong authority in the room as you move around. Absolutely it does. In the current situation, that's really difficult because obviously we're teaching right from the front and in September that may still be the case. However, as things return to a new normal and colleagues and yourselves can move around the room, live marking is such an empowering tool. It means that you can engage with the children. It means that you can look over their work from a distance or close up, depending on the situation in September, it means that you can see close up and personal almost what they're doing. And you can there and then stamp their book or comment to them, give them verbal feedback as they're working. It ensures the children are maintaining, uh, remaining on task, sorry, and that they are focused because if you are moving around and they don't know where you are in the classroom, it does keep those heads down and that work ethic going. It also, it's a lovely thing if you're looking after a piece of work and you're able to say to the pupil, that looks terrific, or you're really using that terminology well, or wow, marvellous uh, vocabulary there, excellent. And then even give them something to continue with, a target at that point, just again, verbally. It just empowers you, gives you strong authority, and ensures that the children know that you're watching them. So the second bullet point on this slide is pretty self-explanatory. It is not productive to work past midnight. And those teachers who over the years, I've heard many teachers who say, oh, I got home and then I started work at 10, work through to one or two in the morning, and then come in the following day looking exhausted and feeling exhausted. That has not served any purpose. No one thinks you're a hero if you do that. Time management is what it's about. Using a timetable. So if you are a person that for, is a much more of a morning person, then work first in the morning. Get into school earlier. Find a quiet space in your classroom. And then do your marking then. And give yourself a time to complete it. Just like we expect children to do. We're modelling their, beha their behaviour.
as we expect of them. Markings for pupils not Ofsted, not parents. That is self-explanatory. It's about the interaction between the children and yourself. It's not about proving to Ofsted that you can mark books. They're actually not that interested in that now. Um, they're much more wanting to know what is going on in the classroom and the learning and the experience the children are having. And it's not for parents. Yes, parents want to know that obviously marking is happening, but again, depending on the department and the school you're in, there are schools now that actually children do not take their books home unless it's for specific tasks that they have to do. So the books are kept in school, they don't go missing, and the home, the child and, and teacher relationship is very much is clearer in that room because I'm more positive because the books don't disappear. However, if you have gone through and used your smiley faces or your comments and then evidence of clear, deep barking every three weeks, parents are going to be happy. Giving comments in your deep marking, not just numbers. Yes, children like numbers, they want to know where they're at, absolutely. It's for their development. However, research has proven that if you write a number and underneath a comment or write comment and number underneath, the first thing they look at is the number and they won't look at your feedback. So you can either put the number at the end of the piece of work and the comment at the first piece at the beginning of the work, but the idea is to ensure that you commence dialogue with that pupil. When you have deep marked a piece of work, whether it's for an assess assessment or just because you want to come into an end, end of a unit of work and you want to ensure the children have um, understood, give the books back and allow them time to reflect over your feedback because children will take their books back, they won't look at what you've written, and then move on to the next piece. There has to be reflection time for them, so they can look at the comments you've, you've written, and what's really lovely is when you ask them to respond to the, the comments you've written, so there is an open dialogue and interaction in the book. Give them time to correct their errors for future learning, because you don't want to keep repeating every piece of work you mark for deep marking the same correction. That seems a little futile and it shows the children haven't absorbed what you've written and haven't learned. So reflection without question. So to sum up, give yourself time, productive time to mark the work. Avoid staying up to midnight, one o'clock doing it. It's not productive for you. And the purpose of marking is to have an open dialogue with the children. There's nothing more wonderful than you writing um, your comment with a WW or EBI and then the pupil writes back, thank you, miss or sir, I will work on that or thanks for the feedback. It's so heartening and, it, and it's, it's purposeful. I hope you have absorbed some of these things and it's been of use and thank you very much. Hello, I'm James Sell. I'm Head of Business Studies and Computing at Denby High School uh, and currently I'm also a Computing SLE for the Chiltern Learning Trust. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking to you today about my top tips as an NQT, how I think I can help you sort of shape your career going forwards and I want to particularly focus on professional networks. And professional networks are something that you'll have already started to establish. You'll already have started to establish these in your PGCE, and we'll talk more about that shortly. The basis for professional learning um, comes from a study sort of by Kraft and Pepe in 2014, where it's documented the impact of a professional learning environment uh, on our students. And as you can see on this graph, we've got um, an orange line representing where their school has a low quality of uh, CPD or low quality of professional development, uh, that sort of lower, lower level of culture whereas the blue sort of dashed line represents where there's a higher quality culture. And what you'll see is that as you get to about your third year of your career, this gap massively increases depending on the culture of your school. And there are things that you can do to negate that. So if you are in an environment where the professional learning culture isn't particularly high, you can still do something about it so that your students are still getting the best from you. I wanna to talk to you about a few pointers that I think will help you. 
So the first thing is professional organizations. Now professional organizations will be different from different subjects. So I teach computing and the top three there, STEM learning, the NCCE and computing at school are the three sort of professional bodies or professional organizations as such that I use and sort of uh, tap into on a sort of fairly regular basis. And they do work together and there are overlaps between them. And there will be different bodies for your different subjects. I know that they exist for a range of different subjects um, and I couldn't possibly list them all. So what I would say is in order to find out the ones that are going to be best for you, it could be that you can speak to be it your mentors from last year in your PGCEs, your heads of department or members of your staff. It might even be that there are members of SLT that may be able to point you in the direction of some that's specific to your subject. And I think they're really crucial because they're networks of people in a similar situation to yourself, be it primary or secondary, teaching the subject in front of a class, and they're people that you can sort of bounce ideas off of. And this is really sort of crucial for scenarios where you're working in particularly small departments where you haven't got the uh, ability to reach out to say five other members of staff to ask them how they might do something or if they've got any resources that might help with a particular topic. So try and tap into those. Equally, places like the Chartered College of Teaching, another platform which is not necessarily subject specific but more just about education as a whole, and equally teachers unions as well. And I'm not sitting here saying National Education Union is the only one, it's just an example of one, okay? And again, these can be um, really helpful in kind of giving you a wider picture of what's going on in the educational landscape rather than necessarily just what's happening in your subject. So professional organizations, please, please, please do look into these. Facebook groups. So Facebook groups, um, I would say, the first thing you wanna say on Facebook groups is just be mindful of your account that you use when you're accessing these Facebook groups. And this goes for any sort of form of social media. Um, because obviously if you're joining a Facebook group with your own personal Facebook, which is not particularly professional, it might give a poor representation of yourself. So just thinking about the wider professional responsibilities, um, just be mindful when you do join Facebook groups that your account is appropriate and a fair representation of you because it will be available uh, to be viewed in some capacity uh, by these members of these groups. But Facebook groups can be really, really helpful. So these are some screenshots from um, an OCR computing Facebook group. So I've joined as a key stage four teacher looking at my exam board, um, a group where people are posting up resources that are really, really helpful for me for my teaching. Um, it could be that people are asking questions about some of the specification content. It could be delivery methods, uh, any number of things. And it's a chance for you, again, to reach out to a sort of wide cohort of uh, teachers that are equally in a similar position to yourself where you, you just want some support. And I think one of the crucial things, and this may not be true for all uh, Facebook groups, but certainly is for a number, where you have people from the actual exam boards themselves, members of these groups. So particularly for the OCR computing group, the people at OCR that actually run the GCSE course itself are members of this group and do actively engage with it. So they're posting comments, any information and so forth as well. So it's a really, really handy place to get a wealth of information regarding topics that you're teaching. And there'll be groups for primary, for secondary and so forth. It's just a case of finding what's relevant and helpful to you. And this is something I've only started using in the past sort of two or three years. So please do tap into that resource. The same can be said with Twitter in terms of being mindful about your professional and personal sort of representation. So again, consider possibly just setting up a separate account for your professional facing uh, self. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say these are the people you should follow. I know that some people may want a list of um, good people to follow, but again, it will be specific to individuals depending on their geography in the, the country. It could be equally depending on their setting in school. But what I will say is make sure that you follow your own school's Twitter feed. And if you're in a, a multi-academy trust, um, feel free to join some of the others uh, and follow some of the other schools as well. It gives you a lot of information that goes home to parents and so forth as well that you might not necessarily get um, by your sort of internal systems. Um, equally as well, you know, it's just, it's good to see what's going on in the wider school as well. But there are loads and loads of different um, Twitter accounts that you can follow. And those will probably evolve over time as you go through your educational career. So you might find that uh, at the start of it, you're following, for example, exam boards or subject specific stuff. But as you move on, you might sort of uh, branch out into sort of wider sort of pedagogy um, Twitter accounts that will kind of give you a bit more uh, a sort of a leadership role uh, rather than necessarily just in class teaching. But again, speak to your heads of department, speak to the members of your department um, and people within your school to ask who they're following. And it might even be just a case of engaging with the staff at your school on Twitter and see who they're retweeting, who they're liking and so forth and building that network from there. 
And finally, creating connections with staff. And I mentioned this already, that you'll have already started to create those connections with staff throughout your PGCE. And for some of you, you may have been in one, two, or maybe even more placements, or even volunteered at schools. And all of those people that you come into contact with will start to build up a picture of you as a teacher. And it could be that in the future, that could be a pivotal or influential point in your career progression. So for me personally, I know that when I went to become a head of department, I had gone to a school for my interview and bumped into two or three staff that I had worked with previously who were able to almost give some form of reference to the people interviewing me, which put my mind at rest knowing that I already had a little bit of warmth with the interview panel. But those professional connections can go further than that. They can be people that you draw on for coaching, for mentoring, for advice. It could be that they're, they're the people that are able to kind of give you a bit of guidance. So if it's a case that you've started at a school and you need to ask a question and you know we use that phrase, there's no such thing as a stupid question, but you may still feel uncomfortable asking what may be perceived to be quite an easy question, but it might be someone that you can lean on and just ask and know that there's kind of a safe space and safe person to talk to. So don't underestimate the value of having those strong bonds and relationships with those professionals in your school. It can make or break your career. So just be mindful that works in both a positive and negative as well. But thank you for your time today. So I'm just gonna go through some helpful hints and tips and just little things that might help you out at the strangest of times. So I'm gonna start with this one, which I didn't know until quite recently. Everyone's had that moment where you write on your board or a student wrote on your board, it doesn't come off. And you realise that the worst has happened and permanent marker has been used on your whiteboard. Grab a, a, a dry light pen, scribble over it, and it'll come straight off. It's been my fear for the whole of teaching. I've never known how to get it off without having to go and ask someone for help. That's one to remember. But I'm going to go through a few more tips with you now about some things that, both inside and outside the classroom, will be just those little things to remind you that we've all been there and that you have got this, you can do this, you've gone through your training and you're going to be, you are a brilliant teacher. Don't ever forget that. Within your school, you have your mentor, you have your professional tutor and you have us at, at the NQT team. Okay, We will be here to help you at any point in time you need us. There is absolutely no shame in letting those around you know that you need some help or that you're struggling. It's better that you reach out and ask for help now and we work through this together than you worry about it on your own. Okay, the next thing that I'd say is really important to remember. Remember PIP and RIP. Praise in public, reprimand in private. In the classroom, try not to get enthralled into conversation and argument with students. At the end of the day, it's your classroom. If you get into an argument with them, they don't know you. They're going to feel that they can keep arguing until they get their own way. Take all of that into practice. Keep a student in the lesson, have a quiet conversation with them. There is nothing worse than having a conversation in the classroom and everything blowing up. But when it comes to praise, that needs to be in public. Do it in front of the class. Well done for that piece of work. That was brilliant. You've tried really hard today and students will really, really take that on board and it will give it builds that building a relationship for you. Know and be known in school. Try to get to know teachers, support staff, admin team, the site team. Try to get to know people because it makes you feel like you're part of the school community as well as that you're getting to know, trying to get to know people. Try and talk to staff outside of your subject area, whether that is joining in with the staff sports team, different interest groups, going on to some of the student clubs, see what they're doing, or even just having lunch in the staff room. But getting to know people around the school is definitely a brilliant way to start for your NQT. The one we love, plan, plan, and then plan again. Our job is to teach, and our job is to teach well. So failure to repair is, is preparing to fail. We know that planning needs to be done, and that has to be done in advance, we have to have sat and thought about what we're doing, using our different techniques in class, our system for learning, all those things we've done before, using our subject knowledge to make sure that when we go into that classroom, we are ready to teach. We have the tools we need to teach with us and we can get on with the lesson. Learning names. So this goes for getting to know staff. Learn the names of the students in your classes as quick as you can. We know it won't be done overnight, but a seating plan really helps with that. Put them in a particular order that will help you remember names. The same with staff, it helps you feel part of the community and people will appreciate that you've taken the time and effort to know their name. You'd like the students to remember your name, so trying to remember theirs is definitely a great tip. Okay, don't freak out when you mess up, and that's when you mess up, it will happen at some time. Everybody makes mistakes. Whether that being knocking something over in the classroom or calling a child a wrong name or writing something on a book, something will happen do not worry about it. We make mistakes. If it has an effect on anyone else, try and find the solution as quick as you can. And talk to people. 
If it's something very small, try and reflect on it. But ask for advice. That's what your mentor is there for, your professional tutor and the team for you at Children Learning Trust. We are there to support you. So don't worry about these things on your own. Reach out and ask for support. Make sure you have presence and confidence in the room. Now, sometimes that might need to be an act. Sometimes you might not feel confident. You might be unsure about something you're teaching, but go in there with that, that open ability to feel that the students feel safe with you. It may mean acting, like I said, but be confident. Give some personal touches, touch of humor. Try and be that personality within the classroom. Don't let students see that you're worried about what you're teaching or that you're unsure about something because it's not going to help their confidence with trusting you and moving forward into that subject. Be resilient. Try your best to not take problems home with you. Leave them in the lesson. If something happens in the classroom, you have a problem with a student, try and think about reflecting on that moment and then drawing a line underneath it. Don't take it back into the lesson with you again. The next time you go into the classroom, start again with a clean slate. If you go in with that preconception that, that student's going to misbehave or the class are going to do something you don't want them to, it's going to make your life so much harder. And again, it's going to make you worry. Okay, so don't take those problems home with you and draw that line underneath it. Mastering your time management. So there are lots of elements involved with being a teacher. We're not just in the classroom. We are planning, we are marking, we are form teachers. We are running clubs. Be very careful with how you manage your time. Otherwise, that never ending list will become so unmanageable, you'll get bogged down with it. You need to be prepared for your lessons. So make sure that that planning is done prior to going into school. But think about how you can use your PPA time. Well, think about having certain days that you mark particular groups in or marking groups of students in particular sets so that you know that work has been done. If you've got to get resources created, give yourself time to do so. Don't be rushing those in the morning or before the lesson. Using your time wisely will make your day much less stressful. This goes with timekeeping as well, okay? Be on time for your lessons. Some of you, like myself, will teach more than one subject and be in multiple rooms. Trying to get yourself at the classroom door before the students arrive really helps with your classroom management. Be there to say hello, greet them, check they've got the right equipment, the uniform's correct before you go into the classroom and if the students are used to you being there on time if for any reason you are a minute late the class will be there waiting for you patiently in their line not running around screaming and shouting okay so get in, in with students that you will be there and the explanations you have for that lining up to go into your classroom this goes into clear routines so reminding students of instructions this is when we do something so on a wednesday this is when i'm going to set your homework and then a week later on wednesday i'll collect it and set the next set this helps students feel safer that they know when things are going to happen, they'll understand the routine and it will make your life easier as a teacher to know what's coming up next. It also defeats the object of when students say, oh, I didn't know when the homework was due in. Well, it's always due on a Wednesday, so make sure we've got it in on time, please. So having those clear routines with who gives the books out in the classroom, how do you expect that to be done? Is it the first person in the room or is it a named member of the class that you're asking to do a job? So having those clear routines, not only in your head, but embedded into your classroom so your students know what they need to do as well. Be territorial, okay, it's your classroom. Remember that it's your room, your lesson. Walk around the room when you're teaching. When the students are walk, working, walk around, have a look at what they're doing. You don't always have to teach from the front of the room. You can teach from the back of the room. There is nowhere in your classroom that is out of bounds and students need to be aware of that. There isn't a place that they can have a conversation quietly and you won't notice or a particular point in the room where they can get away with not doing any work. They need to know that it's your room and you will be moving around that room. You might stand at the back while they're completing a few questions or you might stand by the door. Okay, but be territorial, it's your room, your classroom, your lesson, and make sure that you have ownership of that throughout. Okay, try to enjoy yourself and relax. You've come into teaching and the profession because you have a love for the subject that you're going to teach. You want to help students learn and grow and challenge them and become the things that they're going to be. You came into this because it's something that you enjoy. So relax and enjoy it. Sometimes the days might seem long and the weeks might seem even longer. But a half term very quickly, a term will go and by the time you hit July of each the year has gone. So try and relax during it, enjoy the time. You may feel like you've come into the profession at a tough time. I know with COVID-19, we've obviously missed a section of, of this academic year. 
and it's going to be a bit different going back in September. But look at all the positives you have in that. You've had time to perhaps get to know your new schools and your colleagues, maybe via Zoom meetings or via email. You've had an opportunity to access CPD that you might not have had the time or the, the ability to access before. You're going into education at home where technology is booming. Schools, every school in the country has learned how to teach online, how to make access to all these new tools. It's a really exciting time. And we all came here to make a difference to our students. So enjoy every moment of it. I wish you every luck in the world. You have had a tough year with your ITT already, but now you're going into your NQT year. Enjoy it, work hard, and it's the best profession that you'll ever have. Best of luck, and if you need any support, you know where we are. Thank you.